And now we can start the uh, first political session on a world in turmoil, and I'll ask Peter Taff, who's the General Secretary of the Socialist Party, to introduce that discussion. Well, Comrade Chair and Comrades, I think we've got a very good, well-attended Congress here today, and it's an encouragement both to the leadership and the membership of the Socialist Party that we can organize such an event because of the tumultuous events that will develop in the course of the next period. Now, obviously, the British bourgeois have not sent fraternal greetings to this Congress. <laughs> Certainly not in the marvelous style of our comrades in Spain and elsewhere. But they've done the next best thing, obviously with the Congress in mind. Their House Journal, the Financial Times, carries an article today, what would Marx write if he was writing the Communist Manifesto today? And they make some incredible admissions in this. They were startled, it seems, by reading a manifesto of how relevant much of it is today. Oh, really? <laughs> and an Oxford academic writes the following, in the wake of a calamitous financial crisis and in the midst of a whirlwind social change, a popular distaste of financial capitalists and widespread revolutionary activity exists. Not a bad, although a basic analysis of the world situation. I'm tempted to sit down now <laughs> and for you to draw your conclusions from this. They come out with some bizarre ideas of a, a united front between what they call the activists, the revolutionaries, and the shareholders. They actually want to change some of the terminology. We don't mind that not from capitalists or not from the bourgeois and the working class, but for the haves and the have-nots, a popular expression, if you like, of the same um, idea. That is an indication from the summits of this society of the enormous changes that are taking place. Objectively, from an economic point of view, where capitalism faces is already in a pre-revolutionary situation. That is not true politically because the working class and the consciousness of the working class has not caught up with that objective situation, but that will develop in the course of the next period of, of years, of months, of years, and in, in a convulsive way. The most striking feature of this peri period is the rapid change, the speed of developments that are taking place. Just look at the last couple of weeks in relation to the Italian elections and the internal referendum in the Social Democratic Party in Germany, the SPD. SPD. Italy is famous for earthquakes, geological earthquakes, but this was a political earthquake which represents the complete rejection of the so-called rotten political class in Italy. The Five Star Movement has come out as the winners, largely in the south and in the middle of Italy, and the, 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 the bourgeois Liga Norda representing the right in the north itself. What this indicates, and it's a common feature for the bourgeois worldwide, that they cannot rule in the old way. And as a matter of fact, they may not be able to rule effectively for weeks and months in Italy because we've had, haven't we, the situation in relation to Germany, in relation to Holland, in relation to uh, other countries in Europe, in Belgium, for instance, which holds the world record in not being able to form a government for something like a year. That indicates, or that's in the past, 
That indicates the enormous political instability in relation to capitalism at the present time. And in passing, by the way, the EU, the referendum in Italy, is not just a condemnation of Italian capitalism. There's also another blow, potentially, to the EU project. Because it cannot be ruled out that Italy could follow Britain out of the door of the EU itself. Also, significantly, the German SPD referendum indica indicates the crisis, the convulsions which the crisis has meant internally in the parties that prepared to represent the working class. The, 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 the internal discussion was prompted by the fact that in the recent elections, both the CDU and the SPD had the lowest vote since 1949. And then there are the tremendous upheavals that are taking place in the Iberian Peninsula, in Spain. We've had that in the greetings to this Congress today. Those of us who've been fortunate to attend the meetings of our comrades in Spain, I've seen the marvelous, the specific weight that they have within the students, but also within the workers' movement. That magnificent strike, let us record here today, the catalyst, the spark was provided by the school students' union calling the strike in the first place and by our organization as well. And what a marvelous example that is of the potential that exists in all the sections of the CWI in the period that we're going on to, uh, 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 into. If you were, looked at the television on the day of the strike, on Thursday, and they just showed in passing a glimpse of the demonstration in Madrid, it was immense. It was one of the biggest demonstrations, in fact, the biggest demonstrations, we believe, since the overthrow of the dictatorship. And these events in Europe and the advanced industrial countries have followed a period of mass upheavals in the neo-colonial world. Look at the events of Iran in the recent period. I have no time to comment on the emergence of a new force in Iranian society. And the working class has not gone to sleep. We see the marvelous resistance of the women in relation to the veil, in relation to the cheda, the hijab, the refusal to wear the veil. That is a portent of that the struggle continues and the most important feature in relation to Iran is the masses have lost their fear of this regime, and that means the inevitability, given the objective situation of further movements. That has in turn been followed by the developments in Tunisia and the Arab world. And what an indication that is of the terrible situation that confronts the colonial masses. Of course, Tunisia was the first that opened the breach in the North African and Arab revolution, the so-called Arab Spring. Then, since the, that revolution, has been enormous disappointment in the ranks of the working class and particularly of the youth. And you have a comment carried last week in the press that indicates the desperation of the youth in particular. The youth have just no way of living, living says this young student in one of the towns in Tunisia. We have no way of living. All we want is to reach the status of slaves who were at least guaranteed food, clothes, and shelter. We don't even have that. That is the reality of landlordism and capitalism in the neo-colonial world itself. And there's been big movements in Tunisia, and not just in Tunisia, but as I will show in other parts of the world as well. We have had the movement in Catalonia, which is, this is the first chance, at least for the British organization, to draw a balance sheet of the work of our comrades in Catalonia. The results bore out the predictions of our Spanish and of our analysis of the, of the events. Independence really won in that election, but not enough to affect the change. It represents, above all, a defeat of Rajoy, 
The inheritors of this is this middle party, Siudi Nanos. I hope I pr pronounced it correctly. At least it's a rough approximation. There's no way clear, there's no way clear, no way forward on the basis of Spanish capitalism in relation to the national question. The national question is now back onto the agenda, not only in Catalonia, but in Europe as a whole and in the neo-colonial area as well. The most important point in relation to the developments today, or one of the most important is the deadlock which exists between the classes reflected in the inability to establish a significantly strong position in order that the bourgeois can rule. That, by the way, is mirrored in the crisis in all the parties now throughout Europe. But above all, I would say, because up to now it appeared to be the most stable, it, 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 it reflect, it's reflected in the developments within the mass parties in Germany itself. Above all, the way a Corbyn-type movement has developed around this representative, the youth, Kenneth, uh, Kevin Kuhnhart, I believe it was, where 50,000 people joined the SPD in order to try and defeat another coalition government with the CDU coming to power. Now, that failed. It got about a third of, the, pop, of the, the members of the SPD. But nevertheless, it's rising on the wall for the right in the SPD, because already the left party, in Berlin at least, has overtaken the SPD, and really you cannot exclude the collapse of formerly seemingly impregnable social democratic parties. We've seen the collapse of social democracy in Europe and throughout the world because they have been the agents of the bourgeois carrying through austerity. We will see a similar situation. You could not exclude that the SPD in Germany could go the way of, of PASOK in Greece or the French Socialist Party and a new formation can take its place. By the way, if that refuses to answer the problems of the working class, even a new mass left party, unless it begins to answer the problems of the working class, can very quickly disintegrate. I've got not, not got time to describe all the countries of Europe, but Europe faces turmoil in the next period. If you take France, for instance, France it indicates that Macron has dressed himself up in Thatcher's discarded clothes and also borrowing some of the ideas of Schroeder in Germany of driving down wages in order to boost the profitability of French big business. He's on a collision course with the working class. Above all, in the next period, there could be a mighty strike on the railways and in the tendency that's inherent in France, that could develop towards a kind of general strike, not even excluding a 1968 type development on the anniversary of 1968 itself. Of course, the world situation is dominated in a certain sense by American imperialism and by Trump. And in the last couple of days, he seems to have banished the prospect of nuclear annihilation by just pulling a rabbit out of the hat and opening up negotiations with North Korea. We'll have to see how this situation develops. But it's very unlikely. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's ruled out, but it's very unlikely that there will be an agreement between American imperialism and between North Korea in the next period. Of course, the peoples of the world will breathe a sigh of relief. Look at the incident in North, in Hawaii, when there was just a, a flock of birds that came onto the, uh, onto the radar and immediately people rushed to hide under the desks in their offices. Children were hysterical. Cars stopped in the middle of the road because of the febrile atmosphere, the fear that had been created by the nuclear 
uh, kind of uh, threat that seemed to be implicit in the, in, in the, in the regime of uh, Donald Trump and the, cla the clash in relation to North Korea itself. And of course, we have the example of what happened in Libya when Tony Blair, Blair persuaded the Gaddafi to give up his nuclear weapons, then he was overthrown. And that's been this idea of, the, 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 of MAD, of mutually assured destruction, has played a role in the nuclear policies of the great powers in relation to the current situation. There's enormous upheaval coming in America that I'll comment in a little, a little while. But in Europe, we have at the present time populism and the right and the right parties seeming to dominate at this particular stage. We have, by the way, popular populist governments coming to power like in Austria and immediately carrying through a ruthless 12-hour day austerity program which has provoked the youth and the masses to come out onto the streets. And everywhere where this is the case, the populists have to come to terms with the problems of world capitalism, which as the comrades are aware, is in a serious crisis indicated by the levels of unemployment, particularly in Southern Europe. For instance, in Italy, of 70% of the youth in Southern Italy, of similar figures in other countries in Europe, particularly in Southern Europe itself. Wages are being held down. We're in a few countries that have been wage increases, for instance, such as in Japan and elsewhere, when the government itself has advocated wage increases, the workers in Japan have put it in their back pocket, but have not spent because of the insecurity that they feel. They've put it in pensions and so on, and that has compounded the problems of capitalism itself. Nor will China offer a way forward for world capitalism in the next period. There are important developments taking place in China, and one of the factors that it shares in common with world capitalism is the boom has been debt fueled, and the enormous piling up of debt acts like leaden boots to hold back the development of capitalism at this particular moment in time. And therefore, the developments in China, there's a reassessment taking place at the present time about the role of China. They've suddenly decided that China is not on a path to the rest rest restoration of classical capitalism. If you read the Observer this week, you will see they've decided that China has been converted from an authoritarian regime into a dictatorship. And what they mean by that is a collective dictatorship, which is like an authoritarian or autocratic regime, and a dictatorship of a rule by one man. And that undoubtedly is true. Now, it's difficult to discern sometimes what is happening in China, because reading the literature, as one, one expert put it, is a bit like munching rhinoceros sandwiches. I've never tried it myself, but it's even more difficult now to work out what is happening in China as far as the bourgeois is concerned. They've now borrowed from the analysis of the CWI. We had a long discussion, I'm not going to go into that here, on the character of the Chinese state. We came out with the idea it was a hybrid. Why has China been able to make the significant progress that it's made, partly because it's retained a significant state uh, sector which has played a role in production itself. There's an impressive 6.9% growth taking place at the present time. But the idea that China would develop from economic development painlessly and easily into a bourgeois democracy, that has now been shattered by the coming to power of Xi Jinping, because you've had now a return back to the days of Mao on a much more developed economic basis with an enormous concentration of power in the hands of the new emperor, Xi, and the, uh, the bourgeois have now come to the conclusion this is not a capitalist regime in the classical sense of the term. It's state capitalism, which is the formulation that we came up in the course of our discussions itself.
But that is preparing new upheavals and new revolutions in China because if you concentrate power in the hands of a group or in the hands of one or two individuals, then any discontent that develops in society concentrates on that figure or that group. It's true that we now are facing Chinese imperialism in a certain sense with the development of the Belt and Road Initiative in which this colossal amount of capital being invested in. And it's in competition with American imperialism. By the way, I believe that they're probably overreaching themselves in this development. But all the contradictions of China will now come to the godhead of Xi Jinping and, moreover, will result in a revolution which will be part a political revolution to renovate the state and part a social revolution on the part of the working class itself. When you think about it, comrades, the development since 2007-08 has already created enough combustible material to create a revolutionary explosion. And the truth of the matter is, the underlying situation objectively, as I said, is revolutionary. But it does not coincide with the political developments for a number of reasons. The role of the leadership and holding back the movement of the working class. The disappointment in relation to the way forward. The fact that consciousness was thrown back after the collapse of Stalinism. And therefore, it's taken time for the working class to find a way. But they are beginning to find a way back to, to the struggle. When you have a Davos, the theme of Davos this year is not that greed is good or anything like that, but the social responsibility of big business. You have the Pope going to Davos and giving them a lecture and saying he denounced capitalism for failing to serve the people because of the ambition for profit at all costs. In other words, maybe a little bit of profit, but not on the scale of the plutocrats at the present time. 42 people own as much as the world's poorest 3.7 billion people. You have the situation in Britain where the increase in wealth alone of the, of the, uh, the rich is equal, is, it, it could, could eliminate poverty seven times over. You have the situation where the number of billionaires has enormously developed. And a very significant comment from The Economist, when it says we face a new Gilded Age under capitalism. And what was the Gilded Age? That was the period just before the end of the 19th century, the latter part of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Gilded Age, it was the phrase was coined by Mark Twain, the writer Mark Twain, that it's glossy on top and indicating a rottenness from below. The Economist, in a recent article said that this is a, an exact description of what is taking place under capitalism now. But then they went on to add, it was no accident that in the Gilded Age, you had the emergence of mass Marxist parties amongst the working class, and you also had the development of populism, mostly rural populism, amongst the agricult agricultural population. They left, left hanging in midair what would be the political results of this new phase of populism. And we would say it will be not the creation of mass so-called Marxist parties, but new revolutionary forces with a new revolutionary leadership. If we do our job correctly, will be the outcome of what is happening under world capitalism at the present time. The number of billionaires numbering just over 1,500 worldwide, is a new plutocracy. And you can see they feel the ground shifting beneath their feet. We could go on forever. And by the way, the economist also makes another point. It wasn't an accident, they say. They're under the pressure of the Gilded Age. We had Bismarck, we had Lloyd George making concessions to the working class in national insurance and so on. They have an understanding in a way, as we have an understanding 
of what is taking place in capitalist society. The bourgeois will never be able to handle the problems that are posed by new technology. Again, the economist just makes a comment in passing and says there was a machinery riot last year. It was the US presidential elections when those workers employed in the Rust Belt and elsewhere rose and struck out in a blind way against the system itself. The new neo-colonial world is experiencing a serious crisis. There's really a turning back of the wheel of history in Latin America, in Africa, and in Asia. There's a few countries, for instance, in the world that have gone through a boom, boom, some of them for decades, but the majority of the countries of the world, this so-called latest boom, is mostly in terms of a creation of low-paid jobs, as all the comrades are aware. This is a basic fact that is accepted in our international and increasingly internationally as well. The situation in the advanced industrial countries is difficult, really serious, for big sections of the working class. But in the neo-colonial world, it is desperate. You have the tendency towards breakup in Africa. You have where it's a question of taking away what already exists from different warring groups. Mobutu, who was, a 32 year, was in, in, in power for 32 years in the Congo, summed it up when the troops rose under him and he said, well, you've got the guns, you go and take whatever you need from the society. And that is happening. This gangsterism is endemic in the situation. On the other hand, we have the developments in Ethiopia where a minority have ruled and now there's a beginning of a big mass movement and it's a question of going back to the past where, for instance, one youth spoke about how he loved socialism and he loved what previous governments had done because at least they were trying to find a way forward for the society in relation to the future itself. The recent upheavals in South Africa, and comrades will speak in this discussion, is an indication of the way things are likely to move. There was an effect, it was prompted by the way, by the events in Zimbabwe where there was a soft coup that removed Mugabe before probably an armed clash was likely to take place. Now we have the removal of Zuma in South Africa and replaced by Cyril Ramaphosa, who, by the way, is well known to us. In fact, he came and discussed with us in the 1960s. He has books that he borrowed from us and we want them back. <laughs> Revolution betrayed. He didn't learn much from them, but he learned, maybe he learned one thing. He became the richest man in South Africa. And he's well known to us in another sense when Alec Fraze visited South Africa. He was the target of the miners in the inf infamous Marikana massacre. He's now the prime minister. And as our comrade Wiseman explained in relation to South Africa, really the government is a criminal enterprise. It was under Zuma and it hasn't changed. The looting spree under Zuma gave something like 6.1 billion pounds to the clique, to the rotten layer in and around the ANC. Ramaphosa is trying to rescue the ANC. It's not certain he will succeed. He may resort to a very thoroughgoing land reform, by the way, of even promising to expropriate the landlords without compensation. That is possible. But he will not be able to mollify the masses in this explosive situation. Therefore, as we've argued consistently, a new mass workers' party will develop in, the, in terms of the, of the situation in South Africa itself. They've used examples like in Latin America and in Venezuela, scarecrows against socialism. And Corbyn and John MacDonald made fundamental mistakes in not differentiating, supporting the progressive features of Venezuela, but not criticizing the lack of democracy, the refusal to break with capitalism as well. Latin America, there's no time to discuss it. But one commentator just said, the general conclusions in Latin America, Latin America in terms, for instance, of, uh, of, of the, the, the um, Latin America inequality, 
uh, is actually uh, developing worldwide. But with Latin American inequality become, becomes pol the political instability of the continent itself. Comrades, what is the conclusions that we can draw from this thumbnail sketch? There's no time to deal in any great detail with each of them. Of course, America is central to world perspectives at the present time. It is the dominant factor in world relations. It's still the dominant factor in politics as well, in the sense it sets the agenda in world relations. But it has, to say the least, a faulty leadership. With that, uh, I'll put it mildly, that buffoon Trump, who openly the press refer to as the toddler in chief. <laughs> and is a nightmare for American imperialism. He could blunder into a conflict. Of course, he denies this by describing himself openly as a very stable genius. <laughs> Tillerson, and I don't believe in swearing, at internal or public meetings, so I'm quoting him here, Tillerson, who comes from the military, which is seen as the only stable factor that the American bourgeois has got at the present time, because all their political representatives are discred discredited, not, of course, in front of, of Trump, just described Trump, in, a, in an off moment, which was picked up by the cameras and pitch, picked up by the microphones, that he's a fucking moron. <laughs> and that was a scientific explanation of the, of the American bourgeois of the situation in the US at the present time. They can, re they can result in blunders. They can be, as we've said, an accidental nuclear war. I haven't got time to deal with the Middle East, which is ca catastrophic. It's a Hobbesian hell. But really, the real winners in the Middle East is Iran, within the, the Middle East in, in alliance with Russia, and the fact that it's now um, uh, arrived as a significant military force. It was always a military force, but it's demonstrated its military capacity in the Middle East. And really, that, that has had repercussions, even in this little spat that's taking place in Britain today with the so-called spy and the use of, uh, of disguised weapons and so on. The, the developments in, 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 in Saudi Arabia, I think, are extremely important, but again, no time to comment. It's only 11 years ago, rather, it's only five years ago, five to six years ago, that the so-called Arab Spring took place. It appears as though crude reaction now triumphs in the Middle East. But that is not really the situation. Underneath, as that comment I gave in relation to Tunisia, the situation in Egypt, the situation that's developing throughout the Middle East, where there's a possibility of new wars taking place through Israel, for instance, all of that could result, result in a change in the situation. But of course, the key factor in the development of world perspectives and world relations even, is the American working class. Is America itself and the American working class. And you know, sometimes art reflects and it sometimes anticipates life. And when you have books being produced in America that are immediately bestsellers with the title To Kill the President, <laughs> and I've read every word of it, by the way, and the thesis of this book is you have a president who wants to launch a preemptive attack on North Korea, and a plot develops amongst his immediate staff, amongst the Tillersons of the world, to bump him off so that and he could be replaced by some other dummy. That is an anticipation of the crisis, in a way, in American society. And then you get on Netflix, I don't know whether comrades have seen the program Damnation, which is really force of arms being used by both sides, by the working class, or rather by the rural masses, by small farmers against the capitalists. That could not be produced in Britain at the present time. It's an indication of the change in the situation. And that raises the issue, I haven't got time to mention it, of the Second Amendment and the question of arms, in which there can be a completely wrong way of posing this. We had a few little suggestions or letters or phone calls Maybe that we should be supporting the right to bear arms, including the arming of the working class. 
in the light of what's happened in Texas and elsewhere, and how marvelous the youth were. They forced their agenda. They forced big business to drop their support of the NRA. One of the, the girls who was in that school has a Twitter account much bigger than the NRA. That's an indication of the changes that are taking place, of the uprising of the youth that is taking place. And they don't mess about. They don't mess about with, diploma, with, with dipl diplomacy. They march against the NRA with the BS, which is, I only found out by asking a few comments, that's shorthand for bullshit. <laughs> and so <laughs> I learned a little bit in the course of the, of the movement itself. They forced their agenda against big business. All of this is an indication of events to take place. A civil war is raging. A new civil war is raging within the Republican Party. And it's paralleled by a similar conflict within the Democrats. And this is adding to the general political crisis. As we point out in the thesis, there's possibilities of splits, as mentioned in the IEC document, with four major parties emerging, a Trump populist mainstream, Republican and Democrats, and a Sanders-type party. Capitalism, comrades, is plowing the ground. Amongst high-tech workers, who formerly were looked on as pampered and as an elite in California, now see themselves as working class and look towards the traditional methods of the working class, of strikes, of struggles, of unions, and so on. Of housing, which is a major issue. It's an issue worldwide in which we have again set the tone in relation to struggle at the present time. We've got a certain orientation towards the working class and above all towards the youth. But the more critical discerning sections of the working class are watching us at the present time. Some will travel into our ranks immediately, but big events will move the mass of the working class who in the main have not yet moved into action. Earth-shaking events impend. We've used phrases like this before. But if you examine it soberly, what other way out is there for the working class and now for big sections of the middle class as well? We must seize all the opportunities, <clears throat> even small opportunities internationally to grow. For instance, there will be a growth in Africa in the next period of groups looking towards us. We have a Latin American school. We'll also have an African school and an Asian school at a certain stage of small groups. There was an article in the Observer, I'll really finish on this, last week, in which there was a guy from Serbia who says, well, how do we organize a mass movement? And he gave the example, we just gathered in a square, we had a battle, we painted the photograph or the image of Milosevic, who was the enemy at that stage, on this battle, and we invited people to come up, to kick it, to, to throw things at it. We had a line a mile long. That mile developed into 10,000 people, into a mass movement. And hey presto, we overthrew Milosevic. If only it was that easy in Britain. But there's a gem of truth in that, in the sense that a small group can have an effect disproportionate to its numbers in terms of acting as a catalyst. Isn't that what happened in Spain in the last couple of uh, days? A marvelous movement which has raised the stature and is now filled out of our ranks. The weakness in that article is they don't see a guiding organization, a party, a revolutionary party, growing and developing on that movement which can sustain and build the movement itself. That's our job in this discussion on world perspectives we don't in any way apologize. Yes, we were an international organization when we had 40 people in Britain 60 years ago. They became significant forces. Events took a difficult turn. We're now retying the knot of history. It's inevitable that the working class and the youth will move in the next period. So I say to the comrades here today, being good hearts, particularly to the youth, who are traveling into our ranks. You're bef before a period of upheaval and struggle, linking together with the veterans, if you like, of the movement itself. 
This is based not upon wistful thinking, but on a sober analysis of events. The economist was right. There will be radicalization. It won't be a complete parallel with the 19th century. We've learned a lot since then. It will be a new movement, a revolutionary movement in which we will be to the fore. We don't close the door to anybody. The CWI is like a magnet at the moment, a small magnet attracting people from other organizations, like in Spain, like in Latin America with the remnants of the Moreno organization. That's only the beginning. We will become a mass force or a semi-mass force. We will take from the best of the old organizations and the new generation who will provide the majority of the forces of the revolution. Is that not worth, is that a goal that's not worth fighting for, of making sacrifices for? The difficulties we've gone through with the working class is a bit stuck. That is changing and will change in the next period. Then we will build mass parties. We'll make the revolution in your lifetime. And then for the first time, we can really begin the process of real human history of the development of the capacity and the talents of all the peoples in the world on the basis of a World Socialist Federation.